the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved of the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord.
who have caused all holy scriptures to be written for our glory. Grant that we may so hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, and our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Soil, and immediately they sprang up, 
since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell on thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root to himself, but endures for a little while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. This is the gospel of our Lord. Mental anguish 
and possibly even destroy faith. Jesus' words to us this morning are precise and made without compromise. His presence in our flesh does not bring peace. He did not come to give approval to the physical corruption and decay of this world. Everything in this universe, including everything living, will age, deteriorate, and either dissolve or die. Jesus did not come to bestow his blessing or peace upon a world that dies. He comes instead with a sword that splits and slashes everything he touches. Jesus came to wage war. He came to put an end to everything that condemns his creation to decay and destruction. Jesus could never bring peace or approval to the sin and evil on earth, nor the cursing and rebellion against God that is so rampant today. Jesus did not bless the divisions we create between ourselves and our neighbors at any level, be it between brothers, nations, countries, social clubs. Jesus came to excise the divisions that fractionate and break down a society. The great physician brings his two-edged sword, not to destroy us, but to kill the disease of sin and evil. The war which Jesus came to wage is not limited to the fall of creation nor the divisions between families or faith. Jesus' war rages inside of each one of us. We profess our faith, we worship, we faithfully receive the sacraments, yet we remain split between our two natures of saint and sinner. We try at times to maintain two mutually exclusive frames of mind. We distort our perceptions of ourselves. We struggle to be faithful believers, and yet we maintain views or support those who openly contradict the Ten Commandments, either by actively supporting them or by passively ignoring them. It's no exaggeration that this is truly the creation of split personality. We've become, each of us, masters of double speak and double think. We are, in fact, now so good at double think and double speak that even as we use it on others to hide our own sins, we're able to compartmentalize it and lock it away in our own minds from our own internal scrutiny. And even when we genuinely mean our best, we succumb to sinful means in our disagreement. We embrace unjust anger, malice, slander. Sometimes we resort to foul language just to make our voices heard. Paul writes as the method of correction. But I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. And therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry. And do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. How have you used double thing? Have you ever supported someone even though they cling to that which is against God's law without rebuke or sanction? Have you ever rationalized your own actions, believing that what you did was right or for another person's own good? while concurrently acknowledging that you went about it in a sinful manner. Did you ever then lock away the truth and forget about it? Now what about that same scenario, but now someone comes to you and confronts you that you sinned? Have you used double speak to justify yourselves? And worse yet, have we ever led an other soul to sin by convincing them of our own double talk? So how do we combat this split personality? Jesus has the answer, but it is difficult to the extreme. St. John wrote of his vision when he saw the glorified Christ. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. And that tongue sword is the word of God, and its two edges have names. One is called law, the other is called gospel. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, 
piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Jesus comes to do battle inside of you, and yes, it will be divisive. It will cause destruction and pain. Jesus comes to hold up the reflection of your, your sin and show you what you deserve for its commission. But Jesus says to you, do not be afraid. He doesn't come to say it's going to be easy. Not at all. He does come with a remedy to cure even these sins as well as give you an inoculation to better help you work toward not doing that kind of sin again. Because the edge of that sword that is called gospel, that is the good news that the hard part, the difficult work, it wasn't ours to do in the first place. Jesus came to defeat and restore this broken world. He came to exorcise Satan from your heart. He came to bear, to bear your sins on the cross and then bury them. And it was far from easy. It killed him. But he rose again victorious to offer you the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation that he delivers to you in his word and sacraments. And now Jesus presents you with both a choice and a challenge. Can you turn and discard your double think and your double speak, boldly proclaiming Christ to a world that scornfully leads him, yet attempt that tempts you to abandon him and sin alongside him instead? And if by confessing Christ is going to invite trouble, isn't it far easier to just hang back and do nothing? Standing up for Jesus is more important than sitting down at a Sunday dinner, remaining steadfast is more important than popularity in any other realm. And it means losing social peace at times. It means entering uncomfortable situations with those closest to us. That is what picking up your cross and following Jesus means. But when you stumble, remember that Christ stumbled carrying his cross beneath the weight of your sin. And now you, freely forgiven, can pick your cross up every day, and when you stumble and fall again and again and again, Jesus forgives you when you repent, helps you lift that cross once more. And we will do that until he brings us home to be with him. And then at last, there will be perfect peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace which surpasses all human understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus.
Holy God, mighty Lord, you know how weak and frail we are. Give to those afflicted in mind, body, or soul the fullness of your human grace, that according to your will they may be restored to health. Hear us for all those suffering or recovering from the pandemic's ravages, and for those who have requested our prayers. We especially pray this day for Celia Cox, the sister-in-law of Lois, who has had recent knee replacement surgery. We pray for a speedy recovery. We pray for Marilyn Sutherland, guest of our food pantry and a good friend of Teddy, who suffered a stroke this past week. And we pray for the Hopkins, especially Carolyn and her family as they mourn the death of her sister Linda. And we pray for Carolyn, for Ben, and for all of our friends in this congregation and all others. And we pray for those who need our hearts. Holy God, my new Lord, you have granted us great riches and gifts. Keep our hearts from being overburdened by the things of this world life, whether in time of plenty or in time of want. Deliver us from persecution and sustain us from all tribulation, that our hearts may ever be fixed upon the true treasure of your grace. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. in Christ, with Christ, and through Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, both now and forevermore. Hear us, Holy Lord, Almighty God, as we pray in Christ's name and as it is taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.